So you're in a situation like that with your marriage, it seems impossible. There's just no way out. Look what's happening. It's been years like this. And Satan is pushing, you're done. God may not be done, and it's not going to be done with that marriage. There's always a chance with God's help. So God is asking you to step forward in faith, follow a series of steps, and let's see what he can do. And we know he can do anything. With God's help, there is hope for your marriage. And Dr. David Clark is our guest on Focus on the Family. He'll be offering some of that encouragement to you. And uh, we trust you'll stay tuned. Your host is Focus President and author Jim Daly, and I'm John Fuller. You know, John, in every marriage that I'm aware of, and I try to take little surveys when I'm traveling, talking to people, um, you're going to hit times where there's conflict, there's misunderstandings, and maybe even hurt feelings. That's kind of normal. Uh, In a healthy marriage, uh, both spouses come together to work on their issues as they arise through good communication, healthy conflict, which is why we talk about strengthening your marriage so often here at Focus on the Family. But when we don't deal with issues as they arise, a marriage can uh, become stale, unhappy, and you and your spouse may get to the point where staying married doesn't feel worth it anymore. And I'm telling you, that's not a good place to be. Uh, Today, we're going to come alongside struggling couples and give you the hope that the power of God, and yes, some work on your part, Uh, will be required for your marriage to be better. And that can make it a much happier marriage once again. And I mentioned Dr. David Clark is our guest. He has written a number of books. He's been here before several times. Always very uh, strong response from your listeners. And we're expecting the same today. His uh, book that we're going to talk about today is I Don't Want a Divorce, A 90-Day Guide to Saving Your Marriage. Uh, David, welcome back to Focus. Well, my pleasure to be here. We love having you here. You're just so energetic, number one. You're fun to be with. I can't believe you can contain yourself in a counseling session. You, you must be a very interesting counselor. <laughs> I'm very active. I'm Are very you directed. subdued when a couple is in front of you, or are you just in their face? I'm never subdued. <laughs> I can see that. I tell them what to do and how to do it. That's why they're coming to me. <laughs> I don't say, well, how do you, I have never, ever said in a counseling session, how do you feel about that? You get right just, to the point. Oh, come on. Yeah, we're going to get right to it. I love it. And uh, let me ask you, you believe there's some good news about bad marriages. Uh, how? Three words, join the club. 99.9% <laughs> of marriages get into the danger category at one point or huh. another. Five to seven years, huge problem area. The seven-year itch is real. And then if you clear that, then it's going to be the 18 to 20-year mark, another huge upswing. Marriage breaks down. Annoying habits, male-female differences, uh, communication problems, conflict issues. Plus, no one ever taught you how to be intimate. In, Mm. In a great Christian home, if mom and dad did that, they did it behind closed doors. I don't know how to do it. So your marriage is going to break down. That's the bad news. In fact, in this great book, I Don't Want a Divorce, A 90-Day Guide to Saving Your Marriage, you mention kind of three basic marriage types. Let's start there. Good. First, we're unhappy but willing to work on it. Our marriage is struggling. We admit it. We're going to be honest here, two adults, and we want to get better. Maybe, and there's different categories in that main category. But that's a, not a, a bad place to be. That's a good place. They're recognizing, okay, we're struggling. We're roommates. Right. Let's do better. Right. The couples who don't have the honest conversation, where I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy, you're unhappy, we're in trouble, those are the ones that end up getting divorced. If you'll voice it and you'll, you'll seek a plan like my plan or your pastor or, or focus his resources uh, and, and the intensives are awesome, they're excellent, I send couples to those, you can make it. But you've got to have the conversation and you have to start doing something before it's too late. Let me ask you this, the want to. We're going to come back and get the other two real quick. But what about the want to that you're describing? How does a couple recognize, okay, we still have, I want to do it better in us? Oh, good question. I mean, that's it. It's usually going to be a conversation brought up by one of the spouses, probably going to be the woman because they're sensitive and they know what they're missing. Your basic guy doesn't know what he's missing. If there's food on the table, if we're okay in the bedroom, uh, if my job is okay, we're good. Hey, aren't we good? Don't, not realizing the wife is dying inside. So she's going to bring it up. My theory is a good man's going to get it. You have to bring it up. You've got to be very direct. He'll realize, uh uh-oh, and then we go through a series of steps, and that if he loves his wife, and chances are he does, okay, what do I have to do? Initially, he doesn't know what he's missing. He'll do it for her, and that's a fine way to start. Eventually, a few weeks into the program, he'll realize, oh, I've been missing. I'm not deep. I'm not close to my wife. So that's where the the want-to comes initially from, I love you. 
you're saying we're, we're in trouble. I'm going to respond to that. What's the male thing about that? Why are we blind to that? What is it ego? Are we saying, hey, even though we've got our issues, it's okay? Partly that. We're into control, and I don't want to feel like I'm out of control in my marriage. But underneath, the real reason is, uh uh-oh, if this is really a problem, much is going to be required of me. I'm going to have to learn how to be intimate. I'm going to have to really get deeper with my wife. I don't want to do that. I don't know how to do it. I'm not good at it. And so if I can somehow convince her that we're okay, then we don't have to do this. Well, it's the dumbest argument in the history of the world. She's already saying, I'm unhappy. We need to have a response to that, sir. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the other two. Uh, You mentioned the we're unhappy stage, but willing to work on it. What's number two? Number two is my spouse won't change. Many spouses are in this situation. Probably the woman could be the man. But let's say it's the woman and you have a husband who is not going to divorce you, but he is pretty much done with you. He is not going to be intimate with you and he won't do anything to change. He won't read my book, I Don't Want a Divorce. He will not go to a seminar. He will not go to an intensive. He won't talk to your pastor. He's not going to make any changes. And this can happen over a period of years. And the wife's dying inside. What am I supposed to do if I have a husband or or a spouse like that? What does the church offer me? Well, Dave Clark, through his book and focus, is we're offering you a plan, a clear plan, that will get his attention, hopefully motivate him, get him to repent from his sin, because that husband's in serious sin. If you're saying our marriage is in trouble and I'm not going to do anything to work on it, I'm breaking one of God's most important laws. And so that's a sinner, and we're going to confront that sin. And we'll come back around on each of these. We're going to explore them more, but um, we want to get the basics right up front. And the third one, then, is uh, what? My spouse has sinned big time, and I don't know that he deserves being married to me any longer. Right. This is the catastrophic crisis when the roof just caves in. I found out my husband is looking at pornography. And it's been a pattern. I found out he's got an emotional affair going with someone at work or Susie that he knew back in junior high, whatever. Or, or he's got a full-blown affair. Or there's been an alcohol problem, a drug problem, financial irresponsibility. He's gambling. He's wasted our money. He's done something that – or she's done something just outrageous. It's extremely sinful, and it's a massive crisis. How to heal how to enter the system at that point, get the sinner to repent and get into recovery and then heal from what has happened. That's the challenge in that situation. And I want to say, you know, every time you're voicing the he did this, you're you're really saying he, she, the spouse, but it's fatiguing to always have to say he, she. So, you know, unless it's specific to male behavior, you're you're really trying to refer to both genders that could be in trouble, right? Exactly. And and women are, I hate to say this, women are catching up in the sinning category. (laughs) So it could be either way. That's it. So you've got this 90-day plan. Uh, What can a couple expect out of the book and the resources to help? I mean, really, is it that simple? 90 days? It sounds like if I could be that bold, you're going to help me lose a little weight. (laughs) <laughs> it's 90 days because I say it is. <laughs> yeah, right. I just say. about 110? It could take eight, 180. Who knows? It, it might. But it's a, after 30 years uh, doing this, I, I have developed a plan. been doing this now for 20 years. This book comes out of 20 years of, of I know this works. It's exactly what I do in my therapy sessions. So it's tested by oh. couples, thousands of right. couples. I don't work in theory. I don't write a book. I don't present a seminar until I know it works. Huh. It works for Sandy and I. And we went through many of these steps, the blonde and I. <laughs> the blonde, as you refer. didn't want to, but I said, I'm writing a book, honey. Help me out here. <laughs> Can we just clarify? The blonde is an affectionate term, and she's good yes. with it? Oh, she is. She okay. loved being she called the blonde. It. Well, let's spend the rest of the time right now talking about marriages where both spouses are unhappy, but they're willing to work on it. We'll go a little deeper with each of these. Um, how do you think these couples typically get where they're at? Uh, what creates the roommate mentality? I think it's the nature of the beast. It's just what marriage is like. And it happened to the blonde, Sandy and I. And we didn't even expect it to, but it did. So this is pretty normal. It's very normal. You're infatuated. You're in love. You get married. Then you start living together and you find out just how hard it is. Massive adjustments, uh, annoying habits. I can't believe she's like that. Sandy found out that I'm a slob. She didn't know that because we weren't living together. Unbelievable, world-class slob. You thought she knew that about you. Yeah, Dave Brown, my roommate in college, didn't care because he was a slob too. I I never got the memo here. So that was a big issue. And then things are already starting to break down, and we don't know how to be intimate. When you lose the rush, the adrenaline, the power of the infatuation, oh, you don't have anything left. Now we have to learn how to develop intimacy. No one's ever taught us. Don't have a clue. You're, you're given often in the church, and well-meaning people, and they're wonderful, and church is wonderful, but you're, you're given the, the goal, 
but you're not given the how-tos. Yeah, that's a good point. Man, so... Uh, that's why Focus is here. Exactly. <laughs> think about that. And you do a wonderful job. No one else does it like Focus. And then you're already kind of on the edges, and then you do the one thing that's guaranteed to kill your passion, stone cold dead. You have a child. <laughs> you know what? What were you thinking? What are you out of your mind? Then it's all about the baby. I mean, when, when our Emily came, our first, it was just like catastrophic. We, we just, our lives were just came to a stop. <laughs> we got to keep her alive. And then it was, we got to stay alive. She's killing us. She was yelling all the time. She's very feisty. She's a wonderful person, but oh, so that, that I don't know where she gets that. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. exactly. I just got to say it. That's I know. so funny. Yeah. You also uh, give some advice in the book about this kind of marriage. You suggest we take these marriages out back and shoot them. <laughs> what, what are you getting to? What is that all about? I tell most of my couples that, and they're shocked out of their heads. We're sitting there at the end of the first session. I say, look, I got to tell you, this marriage is awful. It's dead. Take it out back and shoot it. We're done. And they look at me like, why are we here? I thought, you were, I thought he was a Christian, uh, Betty, uh, Bob. I say, look, your first marriage is over. We're not going back to that one. We're going to redo. We're going to heal from what's happened. Uh-huh. And with God's principles, we're going to put into place the brand new marriage, which is going to take you the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. So that's a little juxtaposition I use, and it really seems to work. No, it's true. Uh, okay, to successfully build a stronger marriage, you believe couples must strengthen their relationship with God. I, everybody that feels that way is now saying, yes, we're getting to the spiritual component. Uh, that's so true. That's foundational, we would say. Uh, what does that look like, though, in practical terms? What does it look like to strengthen your relationship with God when you're in this kind of marriage? Well, here's the nuts and bolts. I'm assuming, and it's a good assumption, because I always ask couples when I see them, yeah, do you know Jesus Christ personally? If not, we're going to do that like right now, because without God's help, you're not going to make it. Uh, but then the second question is, how are you personally doing in your relationship with God through Jesus? Church attendance may be a little lax. Uh, I'm not having a quiet time. You're not close to God. So if you're not close to God or ma'am, you, you're not, we can't do the steps in my book. We're going to have to we start with that. Let's get your faith back where it belongs. One of Satan's most effective tools is using marital unhappiness to draw you away from God. Huh. He's a master at it. I don't want to go to church. We're unhappy, you know, and we're just drifting apart. And so we don't want to pray together. Everything falls apart, but it's you and God that's the main thing. So we start getting that back. And most of the couples on my office hang their head. They know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't get pushback. They say, you're right. And the man will say, I'm the leader. I should make sure we go to church. You know, let me ask you, David, that's an interesting observation with the couples that come to you. How many come to you that are struggling, that are, do have a you know a good, healthy relationship with God? They're reading the Word regularly. They're praying regularly, maybe hopefully praying together regularly. How many of those couples come in for help? 3%. Three I mean, percent. Seriously, that's, Think of that's, that. oh, it, that's why it's in the book. It's major league. I am not close to God. It's only with God's power that I can love this opposite sex person. Once I lose that connection, I, I literally cannot do it. You know, that fits with national survey work, that it's somewhere around one to three percent that uh, the, whole, the whole country of Christians would say that. If we're engaged with each other, if we're healthy spiritually, very few people have marital difficulty right. at the level that it's going to tear it apart. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you this. You believe the breakdown of most marriages is a breakdown in communication, and we see that here at Focus. It sounds so simple. I, I was talking to Gene the other night, and we, we were talking about how many generations do we have to go through? <laughs> you know, When will we say, oh, it's communication, because we've been talking about it for like 2,000 yeah. years, yeah. You know that we need to communicate better. We need to love and respect each other. Uh, why is this so hard to do if it's so obvious? You know, nobody knows how. When you're dating, and even early in marriage, you think you know how. You think you're having deep conversations. In fact, you are not because you don't know how. Every parent listening should actually sit their kids down, and there should be a crash course over the course of, of years actually teaching them how to communicate with the opposite sex. Nobody does it because you don't think to do it. Well, that'll just work out. We worked it out. They'll work it out. No, we, we need to have as part of premarital education in this country, and the church can be involved in that, very clear, I'm going to teach you how to communicate. That's what I do with my premarital couples. Wow. Think I mean, of that. Hey, just it would be in huge. Every way. Yeah, huge. They think they already know. They don't know. And we'll hear more in just a moment. Let me just say real quick, uh, this is Focus on the Family, and our guest is Dr. David Clark. You can stop by our website or give us a call for a copy of his great book, I Don't Want a Divorce, A 90-Day Guide to Saving Your Marriage. Uh, we also have a CD or a download of this broadcast, focusonthefamily.com slash radio or 1-800, the letter A and the word family. 
So that air of communication, uh, the book, the 90-day program addresses that head on. Another one, and this I think is, if not equal to, maybe greater than because it starts everything else, selfishness. I mean, I think, uh, Dr. Clark, the main reason God set it up this way, why opposites attract. I mean, he's probably smiling a bit because he's moving us toward his character, selflessness in marriage. Uh, Speak to that issue of how selfishness can destroy a marriage. Oh, boy. It works every time it's tried, and it's tried every time. And and I I think of my marriage specifically. I was – I have a wonderful mother, Kathleen Clark. I'm sure she's listening to this. I always give her a hard time. It's always the mom's fault. But anyway, she (laughs) Yeah, right. Wait a minute. I'm sticking up for moms. She was so loving and so gracious. And and I think I was the baby. It's great to be the baby. And so I was spoiled. I come into marriage. Everything had been taken care of. And I was a great kid. Don't get me wrong. I was a great kid. And, and I really was uh, didn't give them too except much. Except you're really except messy. Slob, well, yeah. except <laughs> for the slob part. That's right. But mom didn't seem to care. She just shut the door. I come into to marriage with Sandy. Oh my goodness, the expectations. Is she and, a firstborn by chance? No, she's secondborn, but she really is more of a firstborn. She's a doer. She's a mover. She's a shaker. She tells me what to do, and I do it. <laughs> she's a rock. But I, I came in totally unprepared. I thought that if Sandy just met all of my needs, well, of course, I'd be happy. And then if I'm happy, she'd be happy. A lot of guys feel that way. Well, it was the dumbest thing in the world. So I had to really revamp. Loving her, we had some great conversations. Talk about communication. She sat me down early in marriage and said, look, I'm doing everything here, Dave. We're at Dallas Seminary. I'm doing the laundry. I'm working full time. And I'm typing your, uh, your papers late at night. I would hand them to her and say, would you type this? And I'd go to bed. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it was incredibly okay, selfish. snares, daggers are flowing right at oh, you right oh, now. Oh. My goodness, what kind of a husband was that? Terrible. Sandy said, you're out of your mind. And so I started doing the laundry, started doing the dishes when she cooked. I got a part-time job because the burden was too much on her, and I did my own dumb papers. But more than that, I had to learn how to love this beautiful blonde. I had no idea. And so I had to learn how to, how to talk with her, how to make time with her, how to, how to really meet her needs and have conversations that would be deep for her. Our first year was rough, 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 rough. Yes. Okay, for the men that are listening, let me ask this question. What does a deep, good conversation sound like? <laughs> I mean, we're down to one-on-one, buddy. Well, you, you, literally, first, you let your wife define that. Because uh, a guy might think this was a great conversation about me fixing the car engine or whatever it might be. The or how the Red scores. Sox are doing. Exactly. You know what? <laughs> no, I don't think so. So you let her. You see, if you've got the guts, you sit down with your wife today and you say, honey, what is a deep conversation? She'll laugh her head off. Ha, are you kidding? You've never asked that. She'll probably faint. But that she knows exactly what she wants here. And you let her know. And she'll let you know what, what she needs. Well, we would talk about a topic, and you would say this, and I would say that, and you'd ask me certain questions. She knows. Is that a good question to start with? It is. What is a deep conversation with me? What would that look like, honey? She knows the answer. And your particular woman will be able to tell you and choreograph it, and you'll say, okay, I'm going to work on that. So it's like a training exercise. Women have a PhD in communication. So we shouldn't be shocked by the speed in that reply (laughs) when you ask that question. There will be no pauses. Don't be upset. It was so quick because she's been wanting to answer that question for a few years maybe. She has. And that's male leadership. You need to be asking her, Ugh. what are your needs? And that's one of her key needs. Let's start working on this. She will be beyond thrilled. And then together, yeah, I mean, she'll teach you how to communicate. She absolutely will. Well, and again, you mentioned it. Someone's going to be working to tear you apart, the enemy. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's right. so successful. Uh, David, you mentioned writing a letter of responsibility to your spouse. Um, that sounds, again, a little intimidating as I read it. Uh, what does it mean? I'm sitting with a couple. This is second session. We've established some of the foundational things as we've discussed, and now we're going to talk about, in fact, the homework assignment is going to be, and they bring it in, the letter of responsibility, A and B. <laughs> this sounds bad. Sorry. It does. But you know what? I don't care. Yeah, I <laughs> know tough. that. You know that. And, and if the, I, I explain it. Look, you, because they come in for a session, it's all about the other person. She, bam, 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 bam. You wouldn't believe. And then she goes back, oh, yeah, well, how about you, bozo? Bam, 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 bam. I say, this is not helpful. You're probably right in what your partner is doing wrong, but it doesn't help. You can't do anything about that. So stop the rocks and the bottles. I'm going to have you look in the mirror very solidly, pray over this, and write, actually write out the mistakes you've made in the marriage for next time. You can hear a pin drop mm. in the counseling session. But you know what? That's how we start. That's how Dr. Clark starts. That's how the Bible starts. It starts with looking in the mirror, the log in your eye. Take a look. Be very honest about mistakes, regrets, things you have to work on. That's A. And then B is what you're going to do, what you want to do to change those things. Mm -hmm. 
couples that come in, and, and a lot of them try this because of resistance. They'll come in and they haven't done the assignment. I'm not going to see them again. Th- yeah. This is a progressive series of steps. I'm not mean about it. Well, sometimes I am, depending on if I've had my chai tea or not in the morning. Anyway, so I will say, <laughs> no, I, this is – in fact, we're going to cut this session short because you don't have the homework. I have no other agenda here. Yeah. And, and you can go now and you're going to pay me. That nips it in the bud. That's good. Uh, you no, know, another one that you talk about is focusing on your spouse's positive attributes. That could be so hard, and uh, you know, especially if you if you have a, a critical nature, mm-hmm. which I think all human beings do. It's whether or not you let it out of the cage, yeah. And uh, because it's so fleshly to be critical, and you know, that's again one of the things Jesus talked about is bite that tongue. You know, don't go there, and. Uh, how would we think about being less critical or not critical and more positive about our spouse? How do we do that? Well, it's a great question, Jim. When a marriage breaks down, as you know, it's all negative. When they're sitting in front of me, they're all negative. The positivity is all gone. That's how they started in their relationship with positivity. So we bring that back, and it has to be forced. Mm-hmm. I say, you're not going to like hearing this. You're not going to want to do it. We're not worried about your feelings. You just have to do it. Faith in God, faith in this process, and hopefully love for your spouse that's going to be developing. Com- we start with compliments. I'll say this next week. I want you to come up with a list of 14 very impressive and real compliments for your spouse. Mm. Physical attractiveness, character, uh, what they do for you, uh, spiritual qualities has to be a real list. And then you're going to drop, in, in seven days, two compliments a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. Hmm. That begin, And it's the most awkward thing in the world. They don't want to do it. I can't think of anything positive. Don't come back to my office until you have thought of positives because they're there. They're just totally buried right. by your dysfunction, and Satan's pushing them way out, of, way out of whack. So when they start after that week, things are starting to change, simply because they've said something that is true, and it starts to connect them. Hmm. So we start with that. Yeah. And it works. No, and, and it's so true and it's so important. It goes back to communication, like you're saying. Um, let's end today talking about conflict, which is, you know, again, another, all of these are so critical. I keep saying this is important, this is important. But the lack of communication and dealing with conflict in a healthy way is what got a lot of couples to the point they're at now, right? The point that they need help. What does healthy conflict look like? And David, you know this. Folks are going to email us or contact us and say, if you're Christian, you shouldn't have any conflict. Address that too. Yeah, those people have big problems. <laughs> There's nothing worse, in my opinion, and I'll tell couples this, than a couple that has no conflict. Why? Oh, my goodness. It sounds right, though. It sounds like a good thing. Sounds, and and yeah. very Christ-like. That's not true. Christ had conflict with a lot of people, and they killed him. That was, that was pretty conflictual. And he always told the truth, which got him in all kinds of trouble, even though it was done with love. Yeah, if you're avoiding, you're avoiding what is actually going on. So you're burying things. Absolutely. Potentially. Right. And that's uh, keeping you far apart. And so those kind of couples, if I'm avoiding all these issues that are really bothering me, I'm not talking about a lot of things I should be talking about. Hmm. And so you pull way apart. You're going to have conflict. You actually want to have conflict. It's built into God's system. And if you handle it the right way, there's all kinds of passion in conflict. Working it through, finding out things about your partner you never knew, closeness results, the making up is sweet. The whole thing works. Well, that's good. David, man, we have flown through this, but we're not done. We've covered topic one, you know, when the couple is unhappy but willing to work toward it. we still got to come back to the uh, one spouse not being willing and kind of dig into that. And then finally, when the the big sins occur, whatever that might be, infidelity or abuse or where there's something happening that needs more serious contemplation, maybe separation, those kinds of things. Uh, Let's come back next time and cover that. Can you stick with us? I'm not going anywhere. Okay, good. Let's do it. And let me speak to you, the listener. Maybe you've been listening all along and you and your spouse aren't really fighting anymore because you're no longer even talking really. Mm -hmm. What we were just talking about, that uh, good behavior, but there's no intimacy. If your communication is non-existent or hanging by a thread, and you need someone to talk to about your marriage, we're here for you. We have caring Christian counselors who can start that process. And if you're in real difficult uh, straits, if if you're thinking, I no longer want to be married to my spouse, we have Hope Restored, which is a great program um, that you should at least inquire about. It's worth your marriage, I think, to make a phone call. And we're here for you in either situation. And I hope you'll take us up on that. 
We want to see your marriage thrive in Christ. That's our goal. Mm. David, welcome back to the program. Great to be back. Today I want to talk about what you call being married to a stick. <laughs> what? Okay, now what's that? A stick is a person, could be the husband or the wife, that really is not into the marriage, not going to change. They are happy with a very low level of intimacy. I mean real low. And they can live 40, 50, 60 years in a marriage just like that. I want to, now you're going to come after me on this. I want to be a little sympathetic to the stick, maybe because I got a little stick, you know, in me. What happens to a person who develops that kind of emotional disconnection? There's something else going on there. It's not like you grow up saying, I don't want to be connected. Is it trauma? Is it protection? What have they learned as a child or as a young adult that makes them a stick? Well, great question. It's a wound of some kind. That's exactly right. And I, if I stay a stick, I never have to deal with that wound. It's a dad. I had a dad that, that modeled being a stick. I learned from him. I saw him abuse and mistreat my mom forever. And so that's, that's what I learned. That's what I know. And so it's not just modeling. That hurt me too. If I'm a boy in that kind of a situation growing up, that hurts me every day to deal to, and to cope. I've got to get a very hard veneer over me. I want to be married. I want to have a marriage. I have no idea what that's like. And I want to be just like my dad. So that's what happens. Huh. Now, that could be the stick can be a good guy or it can be a bad guy. The stick that's a good guy is when the wife comes to him and says, we've got a problem. I'm not happy. Uh, and, and we need to make some changes. A good guy will always, listen to me, always say, oh, some resistance. But after that, we'll say, you know what? I love you. You're right. What do we have to do? A bad guy will say, no, get out of my face. You're wrong. I'm right. I'm not going to make any changes. Tough. Now, that's a sinning guy. And in part, is that response because they are comfortable, too comfortable with who they are? Oh, yeah. They don't want to make any changes. Right. I'm fine just the way I am, thank you very much. What you're asking of me would not only be way outside my comfort zone, but it's going to get, they don't say this, it's going to get me close to my wound. It's going to get me into my wound. Right. I'm not doing that. Okay. Now, so but, let's go to it. Um, so you're married to the stick. You want changes. You want more intimacy. You don't want a roommate. Um, so this is that second phase that we talked about last time. Uh, one spouse wants change. The other spouse doesn't. Now, we also spoke about both spouses wanting change last time. So this is the other side of that coin. What does the person, the wounded spouse, begin to do to confront this? Well, what you don't do is follow the typical and very traditional Christian approach, which is keep on loving him. If you love that guy who's a stick for 30 days, I've, I've heard 60 days, I've heard five or six months, you meet needs, you don't make an issue out of anything, he's going to turn around miraculously and start loving you. That's the dumbest thing anybody ever said. It's not true. It's never been true. Okay, to the believer in that, though, you're saying, I've seen thousands of couples that have tried that. It's never worked. It's literally never worked. If you've got a stick, now that works with a really great guy who's in the first category. We're not in the first category anymore. Right. That guy will We're respond to that. We both want to work something right. out. That works like a charm, but it's also applied to the stick, and that even a good stick will not respond to that. Huh. He, you keep loving me, I'm, even if I'm a good stick, if you keep loving me, I think you're fine. I have no reason to change. You've not gotten my attention. So what's confrontation look like from the healthy person? You set a meeting, and it's a very serious come-to-Jesus meeting with your stick, who's a, who's a husband. Could be the wife. That's a husband in this case. Um, honey, in three days, we're going to have a very serious meeting about our marriage, and uh, the kids are going to be out of the home. We're going to sit down. I'm going to make a presentation. And I want you to think and pray before the meeting. So will I. That will get the man's attention. Hopefully, if it's a good stick, he'll respond. But we're, we're edging into he's not a good guy, but we're going to give him an opportunity. He'll say, I want to talk about it right now, or I'm not going to talk at all. It's going to be three days. And it's a one-way conversation uh, when you do sit down. And it's, I'm going to make a presentation of five, ten minutes. I'm going to speak the truth about our marriage, and I don't want any response. Because what you're going to get is defensiveness, and I can't believe you're saying this, and all that stuff. Forget it. I'm going to say, you're not even going to entertain the response. If he interrupts you, you're going to walk away and give him a note that says the same thing. You're not going to have a dialogue. Because he'll give the same dumb response he's always given. And you're sick of hearing that, and you should be, frankly. So I'm unhappy in our marriage. Here's why. I'm part of the problem, too. I'm not saying I'm not. I, let's go through a series of steps, and I don't want a divorce, for example, that, that is going to turn our marriage around. I'm asking to think and pray about that. I am not happy. You don't use the words, I love you, in that first meeting. Because huh. if he hears that, you're done. I think I'm okay. She loves me. It's always going to hear. So he hears nothing else. Boom. Exactly. So 
After 30 years, you figure some things out. So, plus I'm a guy. So you, you lay it on them and literally you get up and you walk away. Mm. You're asking for a response mm, within the next week. If he's a good stick, it won't take him a week. It'll take him 30 minutes. It'll take him 25 seconds. He'll be following you down the hallway. If he does not respond or responds in a very negative way, now we know we've got a serious sinner on, in our, on our hands. He's not going to change. Now, this sounds a like Matthew 18, is that the basic biblical principle you're yes, applying here? That's exactly And, and what's, the, what's the sin you're seeing here? Just, I don't want to change? That, I don't remember that being listed. Just uh, lack of connection, right? Mm. Yeah, it's any, anything short of loving your wife as Christ loved the church is, in my book, a sin. Mm. Now, it, it's not a sin if you get the guy's attention, first phase or first category we talked about. If he changes right away and there's repentance, we're done. We're going to move on. We're going to build a new marriage together. But if I resist you on that, I am in serious sin. I'm attacking the most precious institution God ever created on the earth, and that's marriage. That puts me in a serious sinful position. And it gets it edges into abuse and really harming the wife. So no, I, that's a whole different category. You've got to, The Bible says you're going to confront sin. So I apply that passage, Matthew 18, 15 through 17, to the marital situation. Not many people do. I do, and I've seen it work. Well, it's interesting, too, and I want to clarify that. You're, we're gonna, the third category is the, the big whoppers, whether that's infidelity, and you'll fill in those blanks. But now you're talking about just neglect. That's what I'm hearing. Right, and, and that is really just as serious in its own way. This guy's not having an affair. He's not gambling, but he's mistreating you. And it really falls into the category of emotional abuse. Now, we know it is if I tell you you're doing it and you don't care. Yeah. Whoa. Okay, then I know you have no love for me. You're incredibly selfish. I'm never going to see changes in you. Yeah. Uh, You know, we've concentrated on the he part of the story. And I appreciate that. And I know you do that in the book. You come from that male perspective. But um, you also talked yesterday about women are also... Uh, more so now engaged in some of the disconnected behavior. Describe what this looks like from the other side of of the marriage when the, it's the woman who's not emotionally intimate. Maybe she's the distant one. In this scenario, she was raised in a home where there was abuse, there was neglect. She's very wounded. And so she's not taking any chances to get close to any man. She wants to be married, and she is married. But again, her level of intimacy is going to be way lower than his. Now the roles are reversed. And I, I'm not giving my heart to anybody. And women are even more sensitive than men, so it's even less likely she will. And she will resist that. She'll cook your food. She will be in the bedroom with you. She will be the best wife in other areas, but she's not going to open up her heart to you, which is exactly what this man needs. Huh. And what can happen is, over time, of course, that this breaks the man down. Because even the physical part of the relationship, if you don't have a willing partner, boy, does that get old. Checking something off a list, that doesn't work. And so it really breaks down. But she will fight hammer and tongs any kind of opening up. She's got her own wounds. So my approach is to try to shake that person up so that they will enter the system and maybe, God willing, make some changes. David, let me come back to that question of the confrontation. You have some very specific steps that a, a spouse in this situation, again, We'll just say the wife, what she can do to begin to reset the platform for a marriage. Go through some of those steps of confrontation. You talked about the meeting, call the meeting, and then move on from there. What's next after the meeting? He's going to blow you off. He's done it a million and one times, and he's going to do it again. Let's make that assumption. He's had the opportunity. He has failed once again. But this time... You're not just going to be miserable and wring your hands and pray and hope for the best. Now you're going to do something, a series of steps. And the next thing you're going to do is you're going to develop a support team because now you're moving into the the other stages of Matthew 18. We have a serious sinner on our hands. He's not responded. What do we do? We widen the field of people we talk to. So you're going to have a solid support team, family, friends. You're going to go to your pastor, church leaders. And now it's the one or two witnesses. Now your husband's going to have to weather, and it's going to be a surprise visit, because he won't do it if it's not a surprise. One or two godly men, if they have the guts, it's not the church yet, but it's men that he knows if you can find men with the guts to do it, could be his brother, could be his dad, could be someone that knows him, and will actually, you tell them the truth about your marriage, you may not have done that to this point. Here's what's happening. I've confronted no response. Would you 
talk with my husband. Would you come over to the house? A surprise visit. Me and the kids can leave. Whatever. You're going to have a serious conversation. You're going to confront him and ask him to make changes. Huh. All right. Let's keep going, though, uh, because it doesn't get any easier. So let's go through what that next step mm-hmm. could look like. The shunning, yeah. I believe. What? What if, do you mean by that? If this guy who now is in the dirt ball category, and that's what I call him, um, a sitting dirt ball, has weathered the church leadership coming to him. That's heavy duty. That's my spiritual leadership. If he has weathered that and he's not going to change, I'll stop going to that church, whatever. Well, then now we're going to go into shunning mode. That's according to the Bible. Now we're in Matthew 18. That's the next step. You're going to tell your kids what's going on. Uh, if they're small, of course, you do your best. You use words they can understand. We never trash dad, but we tell the truth. Dad's not been meeting my needs. Here's the story. Older kids, maybe they're at college. You make the call. Here's what, because when you start shunning, they're going to notice, obviously. This is big time uh, confronting of sin. So you tell them what's going on. The support team's on board. And now you're going to go into shunning mode. Could be a week, could be two weeks. God will guide you. But you just shut down the relationship. I don't talk to you. I don't say anything to you unless I absolutely have to. I don't do your laundry. We're sleeping in separate bedrooms. I don't sit in church with you. This is upping the ante. And hopefully shaking that center up. Mm-hmm. Hard to do. You, with God's help, you can do it. You've got to have the support team. It is heavy duty. But the man's asking for it because he's not responded to the other reasonable steps. He could have answered your first confrontation and avoided all this. The one or two witnesses, if he's weathered that, he's weathered the church leader. So now we're going to ignore him. You're not going to make food for him. You'll make food for the family, and it's as if he doesn't exist. Now we'll see how he likes it. This is, now, again, this is, it's a form of punishment, but we're trying to actually shake him up, bring him back to the Lord so things can change. Yeah, David, in a world that is all about accommodation Hmm. and being kind, this sounds really rough. It is rough. And most ladies listening will go, wow, I don't know if I'm strong enough. Yes, you are. We have the Bible, story after story. In fact, every story in the Bible is of a person who, with God's help and power, didn't said things they could never do on their own. You can do it. And, of course, the book will guide you through. I don't want a divorce, but this is something that you can do. And you now, you're listening to me now. You have spent five years, seven years, 10 years, 25 years doing it the other way. Yeah. How has that gone? Accommodating, loving, putting up with, keeping the secret. It has not worked. Yeah. And you're about finished as a person. What about the fear, though? Uh, let's say I'm the guy and I'm, I'm going to shun her. And the fear is she's going to actually run and go find somebody else. Or the peace that that spouse finds in that setting. Wow, Mm -hmm. this is so much easier. Why stay married? Oh, yeah, yeah. Those are bona fide options that could happen, and I say that we're going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. That person's already gone. People say, well, if I do this, yeah, like John's saying, well, then they're they're going to be leave for sure. They're already gone. I am telling you, at this level of confrontation, we're into the system here. If you have to shun, for heaven's sake, that person's gone. They can care less about you. There's no love. So you have no risk. You're speeding up maybe the inevitable. If they go out and have an affair or if they divorce you, that's awful, but that's what they choose. You're, you're probably going to do that anyway is what exactly. you're hmm. You know what? And now you've at least done all you can do before God to maybe save it. And the kids are important too. Kids need to see you don't take that kind of abuse over the course of 15, 20 years. You're raising kids now who are going to go out and have the same thing happen to them. Your little boys are going to abuse. If you've put up with your husband, they're going to be abusive. And your little girls are going to accept it. We change that legacy right now by taking these steps. Wow. I mean, this is deep stuff. It's biblical. It's there. But, um, man, it is difficult. It is. Um, That next step after that shunning phase would be a separation. I've had marriage experts sit here, John, and say we need actually a bit more separation Mm -hmm. in marriage to make people appreciate what they have. I don't know that that is the right thing, but talk about the effect and the good outcome of separation. Well, this is the last stage of Matthew 18. You don't want to go there, but God says now this is next. If we have someone who doesn't respond to shunning, okay, now you're going to circle the wagons. You're going to get financially ready. You're going to make sure your kids are ready. You got your support team in operation, got your church on board. And now you're going to, you may have to get a job, get retrained. You're going to have to Mm -hmm. see an attorney. All these things are important now for the separation. It's a big deal, but you know what? That's to protect you and your kids. That's what it's really about now. Plus, it's the last gasp of a chance for this incredible sinner. I'm not going to live with you. I'm not going to allow you to destroy me and destroy our kids, maybe our grandkids. I'm I'm done with that. That's a very strong message. Now, if he wants you back, he's going to have to get you back. Yeah, and that, again, the goal is all good. 
It's just tough getting there. Right. This and, this uh, is I've seen this save many marriages because even these guys that are really sinning, there's a chance with these series of progressive steps, more and more intense. Of course, that's what the Bible is. The Bible, it's the word of God. It works. Can turn this kind of person around. And if it doesn't, you follow the Bible. And they're done. They're gone. Let's move to the third category, as you described the three marriage types, two of which I just gave. The third one is where that spouse does something so egregious, really the unpardonable sin. Uh, maybe it was an affair. Let's assume that. Uh, let's put it in the in the opposite order this time. Let's say a wife, a woman has the affair in this case. Yeah. Uh, what did the dynamics of that look like? I'm sitting with a couple, and if that's the case... And let's say they're both sitting there. Then I turn to the woman, and of course I'm reading. I'm reading repentance. Are you sorry? When an affair is revealed, and you know your partner knows, this lady knows her husband's knows. If she doesn't stop it and doesn't break apart and fall to her knees begging for forgiveness, how could I? Serious problem. So if I'm reading that, mm, we're going to have to go to the tough love steps sooner than I'd like to. If we have repentance, that's one thing. But I, I'm very clear on this, and a lot of Christians get this messed up, and they're not re- they're reading the same Bible, but they're they're misreading it. That sin is completely that woman's fault, 100%. Not 98 even, 100. If I choose to sin, I sin. The Bible's very clear on that. I can't blame anybody else. So if I'll, I'll ask her, are you owning 100% of this? Is there brokenness? Here, and here's a series of steps. And the first steps are, of course, you stop the affair completely. You make a phone call. You make a text. I'm done. I'm out. You break off any contact with that person, right? Stinking now. And if you don't, I'm not seeing you again. I'll I'll see your husband and we'll do some tough love things, but I'm done with you. That's just what Jesus would say. Okay. I'm telling you on the authority of scripture to stop the sin. There's no process of stopping sin. You just stop it in in that context. Mm. We'll do the healing along the way, but stop it. And then we're going to focus on the affair. We're going to focus on the sin. That's the first phase, first two or three months. Nothing but what you did wrong. I don't want to hear about the marriage. We're not doing that right now. That second phase, you'll stop it and you'll help your husband heal from this terrible thing you've done. You will tell the entire truth about the affair verbally as well as you'll write it out. I have them write out the narrative of the affair. might be 25 pages long if it was a two-year affair. It might be four or five pages, but I want the truth, not the gory details of the sex or the physical part, but uh, everything else. And that is a power, as someone who will do that, that's someone who's repentant. So I'm testing that right away. But when they actually read it in my office, wow, God uses those moments of confession. Plus the other person can't heal unless they know the truth. Hmm. I'm sorry I had the affair. We'll keep it general. Gosh, I'm so sorry. Would you forgive me? That doesn't cut it. There's no marital change. There can be nothing. What I say is if there's true repentance and recovery uh, with both of them, then that, that's the core. They're getting reconnected even as we go through those steps. And the person has to heal and forgive. Now, the other partner verbalizes questions and awful pain, and, and there's a number of conversations directly on point about the adultery. And then that person writes what I call the document of response. You can see how popular this approach is uh, initially because yeah. people go, you've got to be out of your mind. My pastor or some well-meaning other book says, no, you don't do this. You just kind of forgive and move on. I say, you don't do that. I'm telling you, it never works. This is the marriage work right now. We're not getting to the nuts and bolts of that, but now we're healing from what you did wrong. He writes back, how could you do this? And reads that in my office. And that's, that's getting them reconnected. And we're getting past the sin. Based on that foundation now, we can rebuild the marriage. Huh. That'll be the easy part. Actually, yeah. I mean, this is hard, but it sounds right. It sounds good, and you're saying because it's based on scripture. So mm, that's what I'd say. I never recommend divorce. God will guide you. But if people will actually think and pray about it, and, and I'll say, I know you'll do what God will tell you to do. And most Christian ladies and men will take a week, make it a matter of prayer. Let me ask you this from scripture it says God hates divorce. And I'm sure it applies even in these tough circumstances. Why? Why does God hate divorce? Well, it it breaks the covenant. Every marriage is a sacred relationship between two believers. So he just, and it's the very picture of Christ's relationship with the church, for heaven's sake. That is unbelievably sacred. He wants that to be permanent. And I've told couples this for 31 years. If you, it, it's a sacred relationship, you don't feel that way now, but if you, no matter how damaged it is, and yours, frankly, is a mess, with God's help, it can always turn around because marriage is different. If you're dating, break up, I don't care. If you're living together, uh, whatever, stop that. Uh, I don't mind telling people to break up. But if you're married, different story. Let's get this done. With God's help, you can turn everything around, and it can be wonderful, and he gets glorified. Huh, that is good. Um, I'm thinking of the listener and the need for that final word of hope. Um, you draw an analogy of the Israelites and Goliath. 
to that couple facing a bad marriage. What is that analogy? Well, here you are. You know, you're, you're facing the most intimidating warrior of his day. No one challenged him because you would be killed. There was no way to beat him, humanly speaking. David could have been a tremendous warrior. But as you see in the story, not one Israelite adult man warrior even attempted it. Impossible. So you're in a situation like that with your marriage. It seems impossible. There's just no way out. Look what's happening. It's been years like this. And Satan is pushing. You're done. God may not be done. And it's not going to be done with that marriage. There's always a chance with God's help. To, to gather up the five stones. David, and David had to actually walk out there. God could have killed Goliath with a heart attack before while well, he was waiting. No, no. David, you're going to have to walk out there. You're going to have to actually throw the stone. From there, I'll take over. But that took incredible guts. So God is asking you to step forward in faith, follow a series of steps, and let's see what he can do. And we know he can do anything. That's true. The only caveat in all of this would be the abusive situation. We haven't mentioned that, and I want to be clear at the very end. If you're in that situation, you need to get to safety. Right now. Oh, yeah. I've never varied in 30 years. If there's been any physical contact of any kind, and it's usually not one time, but even one time, you're out. We have an immediate separation. We use the church uh, as covering. Hopefully, we have, a, we have a shelter. People are stepping forward. Oh, yeah. That's beyond the pale. We're separating now. Yeah, that is good, and it's good for people to know. Uh, David, this has been so strong. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you, and for having the courage to do this. I'm telling you, it's tough stuff. Well, it is. And let me turn to you. Um, You're listening. It's touched your heart. Maybe you're in a tough situation. Your marriage is hurting. You're hurting. Uh, We want to help you. We have caring Christian counselors available on staff to give you that initial consultation and kind of guide you in your next steps to recover and to restore your marriage. Uh, They can also tell you about our Hope Restored program, which is a marriage intensive for couples like you. And as we've mentioned, this is a four-day marriage program located in Branson, Missouri. And we believe so strongly that it will help you, that we want you to know about and act on it. Uh, 80% of the couples that go two years later are still married and doing better. And we want you to be able to experience that kind of victory in your relationship. So speak with a counselor today and find out more about Hope Restored. Our number is 800, the letter A in the word family, 800-232-6459. And due to the call volume, we may have to take your name and number, but we will give you a call back just as soon as possible. Uh, Today's program, uh, it highlights why we exist. Uh, We want to save your marriage and to help save many others. Last year, 130,000 marriages were saved through the work at Focus on the Family. So if you're in a good spot with your marriage, would you help us help struggling couples in the name of Christ? 